Um, first off, I, I want to introduce, I'll let Dan introduce himself. He's with uh, Washington College. Go ahead and tell him. Yeah, Dan Small from Washington College. And along with Kathy Thornton, I run a project called the Natural Lands Project, which uh, basically works with landowners, both public and private on the shore here, interested in creating good habitat on their properties and have a lot of partners um, uh, to do wetlands and forest plantings. But our, our focus is mostly meadow, early seasonal habitat to help declining uh, wildlife populations, most notably northern bobwhite. Cool. Uh, we thought the first thing that would be fun to do is to ask uh, some questions of all you guys. Um, one of the first questions we thought is like, how many people here have heard bobwhite quail? Do they know the call, have heard them out in their native environment? Oh, oh that's a good show of hands. Yeah, the next question is, how recently? Yeah. When was the last time? Yeah. Anymore? Years? Yeah. How many years? Decades? A lot of people, it's decades. Uh, Ed, uh, Ed, uh, the Chesapeake, uh, the Quail Forever Chesapeake Bay chapter president, um, Eddie Beck, I'm trying to blank on his last name. Eddie Beck said he was a child when he last heard it. He was, and he's a he's a retired gentleman now. So it was when he was in high school when he last heard them. So it's been decades, and that's about what it sounds like. <laughs> um, and I guess the last question is like, how many people would like to do habitat and learn how to get them back? I mean, show of hands, people. It seems like there's a lot of interest in that and trying to bring those birds back. So. Um, so I think we would thought we'd start with how we got here, a big topic, and we'll talk about some of the habitat changes, like what brought, what made them disappear, and then talk about some of the solutions and things we can we can do to try and bring them back. So um, our first thing on uh, what brought us here, Dan, you want to give your notes in front of you? You have them in your mind. Yeah, I, you can just help. Um, I'll help you along. Go I'll ahead. Say, yeah. So. Um, obviously, today's landscape looks very differently than when quail were kind of at their what we know as their peak from 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 breeding birds uh, survey studies. You know, back in the '60s, on the survey routes, they were hearing 25 to 3,000 birds per summer on these dedicated routes. Now it's less than 20. So landscape has changed across Maryland dramatically, um, and. A lot of it has to do with the farming practices that have changed, um, and we have a list of things that we can go through. So, um, but certainly field sizes have grown dramatically. Um, we're doing very much um, sort of monoculture crops now. We don't have any fallow field rotations or um, or 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 um, weedy fields. They're very clean, so there's not a lot of habitat within the farm field and up against the edge. And as Luke kind of pointed out when we were down there, edges of these this property is a great example. It's a little bit nicer on this side here, but a lot of it is pretty open underneath, uh, right up to the, the forest edge. So habitat on the ground across most of our the eastern shore is very limited. So um, there's another great part of the property that we're not going to get to today that has a ton of hedgerows, uh, very different from this side. And so those have obviously disappeared a ton from the landscape. And as the habitat shrinks and the farming practices and urban uh, development picks up, um, predators have such smaller areas to search for birds. And this is for, true for quail, but all the grassland wildlife depends on these open spaces. And so predator populations increase and the area that they're searching is now smaller and it just exacerbates itself um, over and over and again. How many of you guys, we also thought it'd be good to define, uh, on the title of our talk, we have early successional habitat. How many people, if you raise your hand, like know what early successional habitat means? It's kind of a jargony word, pretty common. Anybody not know? Feel free, it's okay. Everybody knows, okay, so we can not cover it. I'll just briefly say, it's those, if, if you were to clear cut a forest, it is the stages that would come back in the five to 10 years after a clear cut, you'd start to see uh, all sorts of regeneration, very thick, shrubby types of cover, and that tends to be relatively lacking on our landscape. Yeah, go ahead, John. All right, so in the absence of any disturbance, it's uh, even from a farm field, those first few years, five, ten, even 15 years would be sort of that early successional habitat. It's this weedy, messy stuff that a lot of people like to see mowed, which brings us to one of our other points uh, that I think uh, 
is part of what I think brought us here and why quail have disappeared. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of that clean aesthetic and what that means? Yeah, obviously, we all know um, around houses, it's sort of like the common thing is to have a pristine lawn um, and just make it as green as possible and there's very little habitat associated with that. Well, we're starting to see that more and more across our farms as well, where it is clean to the edge. Um, it goes from this kind of nice bean field to a forest edge with very little in between. Um, and even farms that have programs enrolled in CREP or some of these other farm bill programs, August 15th, they're allowed to mow them. Um, that's still well within the breeding season. Um, goldenrod asters are still two months away from even flowering. And so that clean edge now is worthless for farmland wildlife. And so it's a mindset. So even properties that have habitat, we also have to change that mindset of how about changing that management routine to help uh, these, these, this wildlife. Um, so it's not, it's, it's not just only about adding new habitat to the landscape. It's, uh, it's changing the, the management as well and the mindset. Yeah. I, I remember there was a property, uh, not far from the Y research station that had some remnant populations of quail left and the landowner there, I, I went and contacted her and we met and talked and I said, and she said, oh, yeah, we're going to mow this in, in a couple of weeks here. It's around August 15th. And I was like, oh, can you maybe not do that? She's like, well, I get complaints from the neighbors. And so that's the kind of thing that just as, as you meet people and get to know people, it's okay. Or if you see somebody complaining about tall, weedy, shrubby areas, just reinforce that's actually really great habitat, not only for birds, um, but Dan and I were talking about this is the importance of it for insects that overwinter in these shrubby areas. Uh, do you want to? Reinforce what that about the insects. Yeah, and I just learned this recently. Obviously, we know pollinators are in decline, but there and just loads of insects are in this habitat we're talking about. This early successional habitat, um, and I just learned recently that there's dozens and dozens and dozens of species of insects that actually overwinter in the stems of these native grasses and and asters and goldenrods and things like that. So if you're coming through and you're mowing it two inches to the ground. In, the, in August, you're basically destroying whole generations of insects that are gonna be food for birds and, 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 and things like that. Um, so there are things that you don't even know the negative consequences you're doing if you're doing that kind of mowing. Um, and so I, we hear a lot about, well, I have to mow now because I don't have time in the spring or some of those areas in the spring are really wet. So um, we're, there are times where you can do some selective mowing to manage certain areas, but leaving the majority of the cover over winter is really important for those species that need it, but also for the things that you don't even know that are there that are important just ecologically. Yeah, uh, and you can imagine like when things start to get cold here in a few months, um, or maybe a few weeks even, <laughs> um, but there's, there's just, when you see them mowed and it goes mowed to a mature forest, there's just nothing for rabbits to lie down in. There's, it's, when it gets cold and that wind comes running through, just imagine if you were trying to make a living and find somewhere warm, even for the deer, to bed down in those landscapes. There's just almost nothing left. So they're, they're forced to somewhere else. And it's just a lack of that thermal cover that that shrubby, brushy kind of habitat provides. I will say if you do need to do some mowing uh, of the habitat in this time of year, if you are mowing at 8 to 10 inches, um, it not, it's not going to necessarily provide enough cover for anything. Um, uh, uh, voles and mice will probably benefit from that. But uh, those in insects that are in the stems, they actually are typically below that height. So you can preserve them um, rather than mowing right to the ground. So some, I think we call, talked about some of the problems. Uh, do you want to talk about forest management age diversity? And we talked, this was kind of teed up a little bit in our previous talk um, of the importance of sort of understory shrubs. And now quail will like uh, relatively sparse forests. They, they, they will live and survive in savanna habitats. And that's something, uh, a term we got thrown around was basal area. And that is a measure of how basically the density of wood, uh, of tree stems on, a, on an acre of land. And so for quail to use it, they recommend something called, say, down to like 40 square feet of basal area. Now these are over, these forests we were at were over 100. 
uh, maybe 150. I'm, I'm just throwing out numbers. Um, but you'd really want to thin it out quite substantially. So there's a lot of sunlight. You have wildflowers growing in between. You have big spaces between trees. And all that shrubby cover is important for protection from predators because these bob whites are will will get searched down by Cooper's hawks and others, and they're they're masters at finding them. But if you have a shrubby area that's four or five feet tall, they can hide out under there and, and be protected from these aerial predators as well. So forest management is another thing to think about as a way to get more sunlight to the forest floor, get more understory growing, and that provides, again, more thermal cover, food resources for deer, rabbits, and other things too, as well as, uh, as for quail in a very thin environment. Um, solutions, I think, is where we're yeah. heading towards now. So I, I would say the number one solution is creating and managing for more habitat across the landscape. Um, and there's a lot of um, land managers here um, or park, park people. And those are the greatest opportunities, I think, where we can make the biggest difference for early successional wildlife. Um, so the state parks have been really good on, on the upper shore at Sassafras National Resource Management Area. Um, this coming year at Cypress Branch, um, and then there's a county park in Queen Anne's County called Conquest, and these are all big, 150-acre meadow plus in size, and that is going to be where you're going to have the biggest opportunity to help these populations. And we're talking about quail here a lot, but obviously every other species that requires and needs this kind of habitat is going to benefit when you're talking about that size. Um, so any opportunity where you can convert large acres into habitat, and it could be a mosaic of wetlands, wet meadow into upland surrounding it. Quail like edges of things like that and those transitions and all that diversity really is really great for quail. Um, but if you're a landowner and you can't put in two to 300 acres of habitat in one go, that's where working with your neighbors across a larger area I think is really important and that habitat connectivity is super important so adding hedgerows back on the landscape don't take up a ton of farmland if if if, if farming is is key to the farm income um, hedgerows connecting habitat pieces across a larger landscape is really important so there's lots of ways to add habitat back to the landscape without having to remove tons of cropland acreage yeah, and that the, those type of fallow lands, they could be just leaving one or two tractor passes to just let it go fallow. You can, if you want to accelerate the process of that becoming habitat and usable area, you can start to plant it with some shrubs or over the period of a couple of years, depending on where you are, even two years, you'll have a big messy, a big, a big weedy mess. And that's actually kind of what you want. So um, just let that grow up. And again, you're just losing maybe one strip of farmland but you're allowing this connectivity to happen between some of your, your larger patches. All right, what other things? I'd, I'd also just throw out there that um, there's a ton of, we're at a really critical stage now, but it's but there's a ton of optimism. So what, what we're seeing on some of these larger project sites and some of these also private sites where we're, private lands where we're connecting different properties across um, the, a larger area, quail are starting to show up on these project sites. Um, and so that it's proof that in today's modern farming landscape, how, even though we've changed it so much, by altering some of the management we're doing, adding habitat in critical areas, we're starting to see quail show up on these areas. Um, Sassafras has now got birds calling regularly. Conquest Preserve is hearing birds. Um, Idlewild um, is uh, down in Wacomico County is hearing a lot of birds. Uh, a bunch across other private properties, they're hearing birds more and more um, as the habitat increases and the management, which is critical. It's not anything where you're going to just plant it and walk away. It requires annual management. Um, we have great examples on the farm that I help manage up in Queen Anne's County called Chino Farms, where we have a great quail population, but we lost a lot of them. Um, 12, 13 years ago, and because we had habitat in place, they all within five years that population was back to where it was when we lost them through the snowstorm. So there are quail on the landscape, so I, that we just don't know about. And by adding habitat, you can make a huge difference. 
Uh, and you mentioned uh, tw uh, 12 years ago when you lost the population. And can you describe what led to that loss and, and the types of habitat things that are key to keeping them around in those events? Yeah, so on the shore here, I guess it was probably the whole of Maryland. In February of 2010, we had two back-to-back -back snowstorms that left snow on the ground for the whole entire month of February. And it coincided with DNR, um, Bob Long, and Ryan Haley, a, a radio tracking quail on Chino. Um, and at Millington Wildlife Management Area, and through surveys we had been doing pre-storm levels, we determined that we lost 95% of the birds on the property. So the fall prior to uh, that storm in October, November, we were hearing about 30 coveys on the farm. Um, so groups of quail get together in the fall and spend their winter in these small 10 to 15 uh, individual groups um, and we were hearing about 30 of them on the farm that following fall one year after the snowstorm we only heard two cubbies and then five years later we were back to that kind of 25 to 30 and we kind of maintained that and the reason why we had that nice turnaround and increase um, was because we had extensive habitat across the farm that we continued to manage even though there weren't quail there the thing the reason why we lost a greater percentage of quail on Chino than Millington um, is because we had unbelievable nesting habitat, 230 acre um, warm season native grass field, um, but with very little woody cover. Um, so the breeding productivity was really high, but the birds didn't have anywhere to go to escape the snow. And it's you can't go too many places to escape two feet of snow, but the same would be true for if we get six inches of snow. Um, so that woody component, the shrubs, uh, hedgerows, shrub islands, eastern cedars are really, really good um, at providing uh, cover for, for wildlife in the winter. Um, and so in order to have a lot of quail in the landscape, you need big nesting areas, and that has to be combined with woody cover for, for protection from predators, and then in this case, our snow events. Yeah, I'm reminded of uh, uh, Cedar Swamp uh, Wildlife Management Area. Where is Eric Ludwig? There he is. Oh, raise your hand up high. Eric's over in the corner here. He is also a quail expert. They are managing land gangbusters over there. They've got great quail populations. If you are interested in this topic, also not only me and Dan, uh, Daniel, I'm going to mention a few names here, actually. Daniel Lawson with NRCS, who you're going to hear from later. He's raising his hand over there. He knows a lot about quail and quail habitat, and he's with the feds. Remember, he's got money. Uh, Eric, <laughs> Eric Ludwig, uh, they're doing great work. He, he just, all sorts of stuff from how to run prescribed fires to everything else. Uh, Kyle Magic, where you at? Raise your hand up high. There's Kyle. Okay, Kyle's with uh, Tall Timbers, and they have now just placed uh, Kyle in a full-time position here to help uh, expand the prescribed fire on the landscape, prescribed fire on the landscape. So, um, Kyle's another good contact to somebody to reach out to if you're here today. This is a good network. Anybody I'm missing? Bob Long is DNR contact. He couldn't make it today. He's on leave, uh, but he's another guy who, who knows a lot. He's a long experience with this. So there's, there's some great people around. Uh, so find them as well. Erin Steedy, yes. Erin Steedy is a private lands a biologist for Quail Forever. She Is she here today? I don't see her. Uh, also another gal in Delaware, if you're in Delaware, uh, what's her name? Sierra, thank you. Patterson. Sierra Patterson uh, is another person. So it's metastasizing. There's a lot of energy around this. There's a lot of uh, money and, and resources to help get this habitat on the ground. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to ask you, Dan, could you elaborate on some of the other species? Of course, bobwhite quail, I think, are sort of a flagship species. A lot of people get excited about them. They're a game bird. They've kind of disappeared. But there's a lot of other birds that maybe aren't as well known, but sh people should just be aware of. Can you talk about some of the other birds that can benefit from this? Yeah, our focus is often quail, but um, just because people can connect with them, they've got this cultural history here on the shore, but all early seasonal wildlife in general here on the shore is it's showing decline as well. And so the list is way too long to, to go over, but common things like, or what's common birds like grasshopper sparrows, field sparrows, indigo bunnings, blue grosbeaks, yellow-breasted chats, um, on and on and on, he like hedgerow species like Thrashers, orchard orioles, all are showing decline, and that's just because of habitat loss. So as we add this habitat back, with a focus on quail, um, so many other species are going to benefit, and that's true for the pollinators as well. And um, so when we're doing these plantings, think about diversity, plant diversity, 
is, is critical. So it provides pollen and uh, nectar all season long, well into, you know, some, some of the asters are still in bloom now, um, which provides food for those migrating insects, but then obviously those insects are food for, for migrating birds as well. So the, the list is extensive that this kind of habitat would help. And the, the last main thing I will mention is that it does require management. Daniel, uh, Dan mentioned, alluded to that, but if you let it go too long, it will, it will lose its habitat value after several years. It gets too thick and, and too grown up. So there are, I would say, four main tools available to try to basically knock back succession to an earlier successional stage. Uh, prescribed fire is one, and we're going to have Chris Smith talk a little bit about that tool. Uh, so we won't go too much detail on that. Um, disking, especially winter disking, uh, around anywhere between, say, December, January sort of time is a good time to be disking. It, it encourages forbs and wildflowers to come up out of the seed bank. Uh, Grazing can be used if you have uh, grazers, that can also be uh, a tool. And then herbicide tools, you can use in integrated vegetation management approaches to use herbicide to kill some of your woody trees that are starting to get too tall. Um, now that we, we could go 20 minutes on each of those individual things, but um, I'll, how about we stop here, uh, open up for a couple of questions. And we are running a little bit behind, but I was thinking we can make this a bit of a working lunch. So as we, maybe we can take a break after we're done Everybody can, uh, are we ready for, for lunch? Is it in five minutes? Okay, so we can take questions for five minutes uh, and then we can uh, do some lunch and we'll sit back down and we'll do prescribed fire, cover crops and, uh, and uh, federal programs. So questions? All right, uh, red shirt right here. I'll, I'll bring a mic so everybody can hear you. I'll stand and speak up. Uh, oh, what, uh, if you uh, do, of restore early successional habitat, what are the prospects for reintroducing quail to those places? Right. Very limited. Um, put out birds that are raised similar to chickens just do not survive. Um, translocation, where you move wild adult quail in the spring to new project sites, um, is a proven way to introduce um, and generate new populations. But there is no magical source of wild birds to move to. And typically when you're doing that, at least through Tall Timbers, has sort of pioneered this in the east here, southeast, and Texas has done a lot. You need a lot of habitat. Um, and so there's just no source population to kind of just move birds to. I think Luke has a dream yeah. that we can make this property into that source population one day. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, this is something, I mean, you might as well dream big, right? Uh, this property is is at the scale where I think we could do something like that. I have, a, I think it would be really neat if there are existing quail. We're not sure if there are any left wild quail out here, but uh, potentially try and make this into a place. Tall Timbers that Kyle Magic uh, works for, uh, they will do these reintroductions. They've done at least one here in, in Maryland and, and brought birds back to an area where they were not. It's a very expensive process because you imagine you're trapping a lot of birds. Many of them will die. And it's multiple years of releases of wild birds. So if you're raising birds and know somebody who's raising birds, oftentimes the vast majority of those will die. They've studied this for decades and it's very hard to get those birds to establish breeding populations. They just have lost their sort of ability to flee predators in the right way that's needed. So, um, but yeah, a dream of mine is to get this. We have a unique situation. I don't know if you saw the big fence at the front. But you can have like a closed population. You can, to get them back in a way, it really requires sort of a lot of pieces to be in place. Predators are a piece of that. And so I think uh, this property could lend itself to that. And I do have a dream of like making this a, sort of a high density quail population that we could then use to reestablish populations elsewhere. That's a five or 10 year plan. So, cool, <laughs> cool, all right. Other questions, I think, yeah. Go ahead. Why don't you guys uh, close the season or limit? You get six quail. I brought them to two or just close them for a couple of years. I mean, I know that this is a whole lot of hunters, but it, trying to get them back. The, it's closed on public lands. So this so, is talking about the hunting season yeah. for Bob Whites is currently open, but it's on private lands, but it's closed on public lands as of, I think, a year or two ago. Even on the eastern shore. Yeah. Oh, they probably do that because they actually take the birds from the property and then they go hunt them out. Chances are that being natural.
Yeah, yeah. Most of the quail hunting on private property, I would say, is put out birds, and so there's probably very few that are hunting wild birds. And if they're hunting wild birds, if they're doing it right, they're managing the habitat extensively, and they're monitoring their population and taking a few birds that they know they're not going to hurt. So those people that are hunting wild birds on private lands, I'm they probably know what they're doing or they're going to shoot out their population without too long. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea behind sustainable hunting is that there is sort of the idea of it, and this is an ideal situation, is that there's uh, each, each uh, pair will produce up to, what, 8, 10, 12 birds up. So they can produce a lot of birds, and many of those birds are not going to make it through the winter. There's this sort of large amount of mortality. So the idea is that hunting is coming from that a number of birds that aren't going to survive anyways. It's whenever that hunting starts to reach into the population that is the ones that are going to survive or it becomes a problem. So, but given where they are, I, I think even private landowners are pretty, uh, very cautious with where they are with their wild quail populations. Yeah, research out of Tall Timbers has shown that through hunting, correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle, but it's like 15% of the population. So you have to know what your population is going into the hunting season. And if you're taking less than 15%, it's not going to negatively affect because those birds would have died anyways in other in other ways. Any other questions? Yeah, back here. Considering cut contracts allow the landowner to mow the grasses between August and September, what would be the best time to recommend for wildlife? Great question, timing and mowing, and that's one thing we want to make sure we cover. Yeah, I'm glad you asked you. that. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, I would say. Focus your mowing, and it also depends on how many acres you're thinking about, but around April 1st. And I would not mow all of it then, so you want to mow portions of it, even if it's like 75% of it April 1st. If you have to mow, leave some standing vegetation, whether it's in patterns or strips or blocks, and then that could be mowed next year or in, you know, in the fall. So you're, you're always leaving some habitat left. But around April 1st is probably pretty good. And that's pretty much at the time when you have all this new growth coming up so you can sort of knock back the old stuff and within a very short amount of time, you're gonna have a lot of stuff coming back. Yeah, I would say some of the mowing that you're doing, if you're, it's different if you're just mowing to keep early succession down, there's certain mowing you can do at certain times to help with your management of objectives. So that could vary as well. Um, Ideally, mowing in general for bobwhite habitat is not the ideal situation is as a way to manage. Um, sometimes it's all you can do, but pre preferably prescribed fire, disking, herbicide, uh, and grazing. All those are, are probably preferred to mowing because mowing tends to create a thatch on the, on the floor, tends to encourage more grasses. And we oftentimes talk about grasslands, but really what we're talking about is, is forb lands or wildflower lands. It's as much those, a forb is a broadleaf plant. It's not a, anything that's not a grass pretty much. So you want a bigger component of those wildflower species in your mix. And mowing tends to favor grass, which gets relatively too thick for these uh, these chicks to get around and, and move underneath that, that canopy. So uh, that's another, there's a, a lot of unique, not not all grasslands are the same. Um, and and it's a very tricky thing. You know, talk to any of these experienced people I raised earlier, have them come look at your property, um, take pictures, and we can uh, sort of game plan ways in which you might improve things that are too grassy uh, to encourage some of that forb and wildflower component. Before we end, I wouldn't mind just giving uh, a quick plug, if it's okay, for uh, the National Land Project, the one I run. I know Daniel's going to talk about some a lot of the farm bill programs, but not all landowners qualify for those programs. So if you are one of those landowners, um, the Natural Lands Project is grant funded and we don't have those restrictions on some of those uh, programs. So we have money to put in Habitat and um, offer a little bit of incentive payment. So just because you may not qualify for some of the Farm Bill ones, there's other options out there as well. Um, and we're not the only nonprofit on the shore here that has money for, for some of these programs if you do not qualify for, the, for some of the existing Farm Bill ones. And I've seen some of his projects and they're like these incredible wildflower fields. Like you can't believe it. it's, it's pretty awesome. So um, any other questions? 